And uh, via telephone, J.B. McCuskey is the state auditor and a candidate for governor as well. J.B., good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How is everybody? Doing think, great. Doing well, well, sir. Pretty good. We got Sour Patch Kids heads in studio in a baggie. Would you like me to send you one? You know what? I'm not a huge candy guy. I'm a chip guy. Chip? I'm a well, chip guy. Man, I like chips. I have to exercise every day. <laughs> well, you all should. It's good J- for you. J.B., this, this is Bill. I think you're also a donut guy. Oh, I do love a donut, but the reason I love donuts is because they're not all sweet, right? So you can get donuts that are a little sweet and salty. Yeah. That's sort of, uh, you know, that's sort of my deal. Donuts are the best. I wasn't going to say because I saw, I, I see those pictures all the time on on Facebook because we're <laughs> we friends on Facebook. Life. So I see the donuts that you enjoy. That means we're friends in real life too. There you go. Um, and uh, my, my 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 now six year old, my five year old baby turned six this weekend, which means she's not a baby anymore. And wow. It's very sad, but we do a daddy donut, uh, daddy daughter donut day every week. That's to incredible. To make sure that we spend a little bit of time together. I can't believe your daughter is almost six years old now. What's your go to the donut down there in Charleston? My go to there's a place called Donut Connection, um, and there's a couple of them here, and they do a sour cream donut that. It would just absolutely knock your socks right off. They're unbelievable, fantastic. Again, I, I come with the hard hitting questions. Well, you know all the food <laughs> yeah, stops in West tough. Virginia, though, Harvey. I I did, but I, I don't know about this this new donut connection. So well, shame on me. Matt's got that Monroe County accent too. He knows all about donuts at the fair. So the best <laughs> yeah. donut ever is a donut <laughs> out of a out of a trailer at at any fair you go to. There's always the one donut place that, and the line is always completely around the fair. And it doesn't matter which fair you're at. That's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, There's uh, usually a cinnamon roll truck, too, and those usually are pretty amazing as well. JB, I want to ask you a, a couple of questions. First and foremost, let's talk yeah. about your, your race for governor. Are, are you sure. uh, um, staying in the race, fully committed, ready to win this thing? Yeah. Uh, yes to all three. Uh, you know, I am absolutely killing myself on the campaign trail. And, and there, you know, there's a, a real formidable group of candidates in this race. And, and, and some of them are really well qualified, too. Uh, but there isn't anybody in this race who's going to outwork me. Uh, there's nobody in this race who has more connections and, and more uh, great relationships with local governments. And, you know, I, I think I deliver a message and, and an experience and a, and a thoughtfulness and forward thinking uh, plan that, that the other candidates don't have. And, and that isn't to say that they aren't great people. It's to say that, you know, I, I have a little bit of a different perspective and a little bit of a different way. And I believe um, that that my message that west virginia is ready to be successful but is not successful yet uh and and a plan to make our government noticeably smaller and and incredibly more effective and to focus on young families and uh the development of our children uh to fix our education system to ensure that our infrastructure is being delivered to west virginians not to out-of-state interest groups not to lobbyists uh and to make sure that we are committed ourselves uh to to ensuring that in 25 years, we look back and we say, you know, the world around West Virginia changed and West Virginia was able to leverage our incredible set of values uh, to, to lure in young families who have the same value set that we have here in West Virginia. I think 25 years from now, I'll be sitting on the beach um, thinking back on, on how we truly changed West Virginia once, uh, once and for all. And I think all of that's going to come uh, here in the next year or so as we finish up this campaign. JB, I would say in our interviews, uh, you've avoided red meat issues, low-hanging fruit kind of stuff, and you've talked about a forward vision for West Virginia and some specific items, too. And I think that does differentiate you from uh, much of the rest of a very well-qualified group of people who are running for governor this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I would tell you, I, I think one of the things that I talk about a lot that other people either don't talk about or don't understand is that Child care is going to be the issue that defines states where people move and where they don't. Uh, in West Virginia today, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 17,000 people who are not in the workforce because they don't have access to child care. And I don't mean they can't afford it. I mean they don't have access to it. And so we live in a rural state where services can frequently be difficult to deliver. And what we have to understand is, is that folks who are trying to move out of urban areas and are looking to live in these Mayberry towns that we have surrounded by people who care about their families and and want to go to church with them and want to support their small businesses and make sure they're successful, they can't do any of those things if the if the minimum level of service that they're leaving isn't available to them where they're going. Uh, And that means 
high-speed internet. That means incredible water and sewer infrastructure, right? We can't have boil water advisories. You can't flood every time it rains. You've got to be able to flush your toilet, right? But it also means you have to be able to take your two-year-old child to somebody who's qualified, well-paid, uh, and, and, and trustworthy so that you can go to work during the day. And for thousands and thousands and thousands of West Virginians, that is not available. And if we can make sure that we are leading this country and providing young families with those services, this is going to be – it already is a place where everyone's looking, right? This will start to become a place where everyone is flocking. And, you know, you got politicians running around right now claiming that West Virginia has won something, right? Well, I've been talking about this for a long time. We have an opportunity, but we have not won. We lost 55,000 people over the last decade, right? We are, our education statistics are not where they need to be, right? Obviously, our education system does not stack up uh, with the states that we're competing against. Our infrastructure is, is a D minus at best. And these are problems that are solvable. They're all solvable with a great plan that doesn't focus on increased government spending, but focuses on increased government output. And in my role as the state auditor, what we have done is over the seven years that I've been here, I have reduced my total staffing by 25%, and I've reduced my, my general budget line item by 20%. But we are doing uh, 800 more audits. We have reduced our audit time by 3,000%. We've completely transformed the state land division. We've torn down $30 million worth of dilapidated houses, right? And on top of all that, we have made West Virginia the most transparent and accountable state in the United States. So what I've shown is, is that you can make a government bureaucracy noticeably smaller while delivering intensely better results for taxpayers in a way that's accountable to them so that they know when you're in the, when they're in the voting booth why they're voting for that person. And I think what I've shown in my experience is I can translate that into the, to the highest executive level, and I can do, the, do what I did in the auditor's office for the rest of state government. Matt Harvey. JB, um, an issue that comes up is that this has recently changed is the the bill uh, the selling of uh, properties at auction tax sales yeah. and a, a lot of, I've had a lot of people ask me about it and they're confused about the process can you give us a rundown how that's changed and how it impacts people sure so the, the first and most important thing that changed is that we instituted for the first time in West Virginia history a payment plan for people that have had a bad year and what we found in COVID was is that there was all kinds of people who, who lost their jobs and lost their income. And, and property taxes uh, were sometimes hard to pay. And the best person to live in any house is the person that already lives there. So anybody now who receives, receives a delinquent tax notice can set up uh, a three-payment payment plan with our office to make sure that they stay in their house, that they can afford their property taxes, and they can get themselves back on their feet. I think that's intensely important. The second thing that we did is that we have uh, sought to remove out-of-state people who care not for the communities of West Virginia and are only looking to make a quick buck off of our backs from the land sale process. And in so doing, the idea is, is that we want the neighbors of these properties and we want the local communities of where these properties reside to be able to have um, control over properties that have gone delinquent and dilapidated, with the idea being that county commissions, county economic development corporations, municipalities, municipal land banks, these folks have development plans that require property. And if we can use something that has become a detriment, i.e. A, a, a broken down house or an old school or something that's an eyesore and a danger to the community to help our local governments and our neighbors uh, realize their development dreams and make their community safer and stronger and more beautiful and more vibrant, it's a double, it's a, that's a two-way win, right? And so the last thing that happened is, is so those folks get the uh, get get priority on bidding. And the last thing that happened is, is that we have shortened the redemption period and we've gone from two sales to one. And all that really means is, is that the process is more streamlined. It's more easier to understand. And all of it is being managed by the state auditor's office and all of the revenue is going back to the counties. And I'll tell you what's really interesting is in this this year's worth of land sales. And I don't have the final tallies yet, but we are noticeably higher in the auction prices. We are delivering a lot more money back to our county commissions uh, and to our county school boards than we were before. And what that means to me is that communities were looking to, to purchase this property. And I'll tell you uh, on sort of the topic of, of delivering money back to local governments, you know, our office just uh, within the last two months hit the $100 million mark uh, of cash that we've returned back to the general revenue of the state. So 
you know, it, it is it is something that we are very intent on that the money of the state of West Virginia and the money of the counties and cities is to be spent by them. And uh, we want the legislatures and our city councils and our and our, uh, and our school boards who are elected by the people of their counties and states to be in charge of our budgets. So the, the redemption period has shortened? Just briefly, yes. Uh, and the reason that it shortened is because there's there's only the one sale. Okay. So if a municipality or a land bank um, purchases a property, do they have to actually put up the money? Do they have dead money sitting there waiting on that to for someone to redeem it or not, or they get the title? Uh, well, you, you have to wait for it to be redeemed. Uh, but, you know, when you are buying a dilapidated building, right, and if you're buying a it, – it, it is – fairly infrequent that something like that will end up getting redeemed. And yes, they do have to put up the money, but they would have been buying these things before, Matt. Um, you know, what our program does is it sort of a, it, it, it fills in the continuum that was the problem. Cities and counties would have been buying these properties before, but they didn't have enough funding to remove and tear down these buildings. Unfortunately, with asbestos and tipping fees and, and you name it, tearing down a house can be a, a very expensive proposition. So we were very thankful to, to people like Senator Tarr, uh, and, and quite frankly, the state DEP, uh, who worked with us to get uh, an enormous amount of funding to not only let these cities and counties and land banks purchase these properties, but also have the funding they need to tear them down and get them prepared for development. Uh, WBU and Marshall estimate that we have somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 million worth of dilapidated buildings that need to come down. And like we were talking about before, we are inviting young families to move out of, uh, of, of big cities uh, where there's you know, a lifestyle they don't want. But we've got to clean up our towns and counties to make sure that these places look and feel and are uh, like we're advertising them to be. And part of that is getting rid of this incredible dearth of, of, of bad, dangerous, and dilapidated buildings throughout the state of West Virginia. Is the $600 million figure the estimated cost to tear them down, JB, or yeah. the real estate value of those buildings? No, that's the removal cost. Uh, the, the real estate value of those buildings is... Uh, pretty hard to determine until you get the until you get the bad buildings off of them bill kearns hey jb i um i um i i know how transparent you are um with your <laughs> with your office and and you have some incredibly qualified people working for you and and you know when you talk about getting money back to the counties um as a public health director you know just one of my parts that i deal with your office and is through the purchasing card program and that yeah that it puts money back into the budgets um in our budgets that we need those funds for so and i know you scrutinize those uh the companies that administer the uh, purchasing card program so i appreciate all you do for there and we, we work with you uh, of course with auditor our auditors coming out and doing our annual audits for clients but um i guess one of the questions i'd have for you would be you know, with Berkeley County, we, and this show has talked about it so many times about locality pay for the Eastern Panhandle. What, and you, and you, and you talked about earlier about childcare. I, I have situations where I looked at hiring staff and they're like, well, the salaries are so low that um, I can't even afford to be able to work here because I'd have to pay for childcare and, and the salary is so low that I, it doesn't give me enough to pay for adequate childcare. What, what what's your opinion on on the 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 famous locality pay or or looking at areas within the state that the salaries are are lower based and in, in comparison to what it costs to live there? So I I think when you are hiring professionals, you have to treat and pay them like professionals, and we fall into a trap, especially on the idea of locality pay. And just to answer your question, you you have to do things like that. West Virginia is is wide and tall enough to where we have cities, counties, and locations that are close enough to other areas that change the, that change the market rate for professional service, right? And I think what you're talking about is people saying, well, I'll just go over to Maryland and make twice as much, right? Uh, but we have a, 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 a crisis with that in, in all of our state as it relates to uh, professionals that, that do things uh, for state and local governments, right? Uh, and, and our educators are in the same boat. And what we ask people to do is to deliver professional results, and then we don't pay or treat them as professionals. And I think one of the things we need to take a great big, long, hard look at uh, as a state government is if we had less people, could we pay better people more? And every single great organization has to go in and, and look at itself and decide 
is it the right size and can they afford the people they need to do the job properly? Uh, and what I found in my office is that we were able to, to downsize the total amount of people we had and we were able to pay the people that we have a lot more. Uh, and, and the savings for us are innumerable and that the work that we get is better. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, one of the, one of the concepts there is, is that uh, we have to allow our local governments to decide that first. And second, you have to be able to hire people. If you are tasked to do a job, right, and your health department is tasked to, to complete a mission, we have to give you the flexibility to complete that mission with the people that need to be that, with the people you need to be successful. And unfortunately, and it's just part of life. Part of that is 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 finding a salary range where you can attract the right talent. How would that How would that roll out to? people that have businesses that's not necessarily within the state or local government that receives direction or salaries from the state. How would, so you have a business owner, uh, a small business owner, how they have a limited amount of staff. So, you know, they, they don't have the revenue to be able to pay higher salaries to keep those staff there. So they change from, from business to business to business. What would, what would be something you could do to be able to help with maybe either offsetting taxes to that business owner or something like that. So they would have additional revenue within their business to be able to pay for their staff. So I'll tell you, my wife and I own a small business. Uh, it's how we make money, right? I, I work for the government, but my wife is a, a really, really successful and, and just a, a wonderful business owner here in Charleston. You know, we have 10 employees, and, and we, we do a pretty significant amount of revenue, right? And what I find as a small business owner is somebody who signed the front and back of a paycheck, which, you know, a lot of people in politics haven't ever done, is you, you get what you pay for, right? And um, what really ends up happening to small businesses is especially the ones that are in the eight to 10 employee range. I think that's what we're talking about is politicians talk about supporting them all the time, but what they really want to do is support their sort of out of state corporate overlords as, as people tend to say, uh, the, the problem with small business in West Virginia is that we pay 10 different kinds of taxes. It isn't that we don't want to pay taxes. It's that small businesses have to pay an enormous amount of money in this state to figure out how much tax they owe. They have to pay an inventory tax. They have to pay sales tax. They have to pay income tax, payroll tax, state tax, federal tax, you name it, right? And when you are an eight or nine uh, employee shop who is selling clothing, your job and your skill set isn't determining how much taxes you owe and figuring out how to make sure that you're getting the best deal possible. I think simplifying the tax code, especially for small businesses and young families, is wildly important. Lowering the rates as much as we can for the people who make the least in these businesses, right, is, is, is just intensely important. And I think all of those businesses would have more resources to hire more employees if both their tax burden were lower and the process of filing and figuring out what their taxes were, was simpler. You know, at the end of the day, what any small business wants is for you to tell them how much they owe so they can write one check. And what they hate doing is getting nickel and dimed every single month and every single quarter uh, on a bunch of little teeny taxes instead of figuring out how much they owe at the end of the year. And I think, you know, that is a possibility if you are open to changing the system. And I think that the most important thing that, that maybe I will say today on this interview is, is that we need system changes. We need bold ideas, big thoughts that are unafraid to transform what's happening in West Virginia. You know, the old adage is, is that uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, West Virginia has been doing the same thing over and over and over again for the last 65 years, and it's time for some wholesale changes to some big processes to get us caught up to the mainstream of West Virginia, and that is unafraid uh, of the criticism that the establishment who loves the status quo will always give to those who try to transform big systems to the benefit of the people. J.B. McCustody, our guest on the program, a state auditor and candidate for governor. JB, we did a segment with Valerie Ledford just prior to when you came on in regards to special education. It is not unusual for candidates for any office uh, at the statewide level to address education, especially for the office of a governor, because we know what the education issues are in this state. But very few address the special education needs in the state of West Virginia. Have you spent much time researching that? And what are your thoughts on improving special education the entire structure of it, both for the student, for the teacher, and for the aide in West Virginia? So we have a mental health crisis within the youth of our state. And we are asking our educators to act as both social workers and educators. 
And I think what we have to realize is that we spend an enormous amount of money on grownups and not nearly enough money on kids. And it's a priority issue. Um, so when you talk about special education, that actually comes in many forms, right? Kids who are incredibly intelligent, uh, who aren't really made, set up for, for, for success in a regular classroom are in special education. Kids who have uh, very special needs, kids on the autism, autism spectrum, uh, you know, Downs kids, kids that have a, a myriad of, of, of developmental issues are also in special education. So it really runs the gamut, right? We found here in, West, in Charleston, just at, at my kids' school, um, handicapped kids were being abused uh, pretty badly. And when you go back and look at what happened, we, we put uh, unqualified teachers in a room with students who require very, very specialized care and a level of, um, uh, of, of education and training that the people in that room didn't have. And it is an incredible disservice both to the child uh, and to the education system as a whole that we are treating kids who need more help the worst. And, and so you have to, you have to, you got to put the, you got to put the mask in this instance on the kid first, if that makes sense. And, and in our state, I don't believe we have that focus as of yet, but it is something that if you prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable are our children and the most vulnerable of our children are those that have special needs. If you believe that government should prioritize their success and their help, then I think it's a real easy problem to solve. JB, final thoughts are yours. Uh, I just really appreciate you guys having me on. You know, it is, it's a true honor and a blessing to have been, you know, selected by my fellow Mountaineers to be the auditor for the last seven years. And, you know, I truly believe that what our office has done has, has started a transformation in our state bureaucracy into a place that is taxpayer and citizen centered. And I think that going forward, when I'm the next governor, we will be able to take the idea that the people of West Virginia's success is paramount and lobbyists and special interests and, and, and legacy politicians uh, are not going to be uh, at the forefront. And I think that is intensely important, and I'm really, really looking forward to taking my message, uh, that message, to the people of West Virginia, as I have been for the last six months, uh, and, and finding out that, that the people of West Virginia are really ready for that kind of change. And, and I just couldn't be more excited and more proud to be a West Virginian and, and for the future for our state. Thanks, JB. Always appreciate the time. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a great day. You do the same. See you, buddy.